I really like starting off early in the semester with a unit on plate tectonics because I think it actually does a really nice job of explaining how science works. Uh, plate tectonics is the grand unifying theory of modern geology. What that means is that all modern geologic thinking in some ways ties back to the theory of plate tectonics. But it took plate tectonics over 50 years to be acknowledged as a possibility and then even longer to gain acceptance in the scientific community. It was fraught with arguments that ended some people's career and made other people's career. And it really kind of talks about the difference here between a hypothesis and a theory, which I also think is a really pivotal idea for this course. And one of the first observations that led to the development of this theory was something that you maybe have noticed just as a kid looking at a globe uh, while you were bored in a classroom. And that is that the East Coast of South America and the West Coast of Africa seem to fit together just like puzzle pieces. So that was one of the observations of Alfred Wegener in 1915. I love this picture of Alfred Wegener, and in fact, all pictures of Alfred Wegener because he has no color in the pupils of his eyes and it's amazing. Alfred Wegener in 1915 developed what's called the continental drift hypothesis. It's basically the idea that continents have drifted into their current positions, that they've kind of plowed their way around ocean basins. And he came up with the concept of Pangaea. Pangaea is a supercontinent that he estimated and then data supported broke apart about 200 million years ago. Um, and here is Wegener's Pangaea down in the bottom corner here. So um, you've probably heard of the idea of Pangaea before. Pangaea translates to all land or all earth. And what Wegener did was kind of close up the Atlantic Ocean. That's the big feature that is missing here um, and had all the continents come back together um, to form a supercontinent where all the major continents are represented. This is a more modern reconstruction of Pangaea. It includes the continental shelves, which are part of the continents that are actually inundated with seawater. There is a couple animations I want to show you. The first one is kind of a slow animation that depicts um, what happened over time as Pangaea broke apart. Um, this is Science on a Sphere, which comes from Chris Cortez, or Scotese. He is a paleo, um, paleogeographic expert and he creates lots of cool animations. So this one is a little bit of a slow animation, but still kind of cool. The second animation I want to show you is one that I came across not that long ago, but is super interesting. And this animation actually shows um, different, it shows the same sort of thing. It actually goes back in time longer than Pangaea, but it goes ahead and allows you to plug in the name of a city that you might live in. Um, and you can go ahead and pick what time period you would like to look at the earth 200 million years ago. Isn't that crazy? This is what it, well, the earth looked like 200 million years ago. And there you see Pangaea and it's just beginning to break apart in the North Atlantic Ocean. So you could type in something like, let's say you're interested in Dallas, Texas, that's where Dallas, Texas was um, 200 million years ago. You could change the time frame. You could go back further than Pangaea. You can go back half a, half a billion years ago. And look, North America half a billion years ago was oriented quite differently. It was close to, it was on the equator in parts. And you can see that it was rotated um, significantly from where it is today. This is a really cool website. So I wanted to provide you with a link for this. All right, so any good scientist, when they come up with a new idea, they have to have evidence to support that idea. So the continental drift hypothesis was in 1915, a pretty revolutionary idea. So Wegener went to a meeting and he described his hypothesis and then he described four lines of evidence that he thought conclusively supported that he was correct. So the first thing that he pointed out was that there are matching mountain ranges on either side of the Atlantic Ocean. I'm sorry if you can hear my dog snoring loudly in the background, but he is. Um, so when the um, when Pangaea began to break apart about 200 million years ago, there was one continuous chain of mountains where North America had collided with Africa and parts of the Scandinavia. 
the rocks in these mountains, even though they have been pulled literally on opposite sides of an ocean, have been radioactively dated to be the same age and are actually the same exact rock type on either side of the Atlantic. And those mountains, if we were to zip up the Atlantic Ocean, like we see in Wegener's Pangea, include the Appalachian Mountains, the Atlas Mountains in northwestern Africa, and the Caledonian Mountains in the British Isles and Scandinavia and parts of Greenland. And so Wegener said, how would you just get mountains on either side of the Atlantic Ocean that form at the same time in the same rock type? Isn't it more logical to say that they were one continuous chain of mountains that have been pulled apart um, from this, from continents drifting into their current positions? So the second line and third line of evidence are related to what we've already discussed just a bit. And that is the fit of the continents. It looks like they would fit together, um, especially South America and Africa. Uh, but it's not enough to say that they look like they would fit together. So what Wegener did was he went and found fossils on either side of the Atlantic Ocean. And here's a particular type of fossil that he found called Mesosaurus. Mesosaurus is an ancient relative of the cro ancestor, I guess, of the crocodile. And so just like crocodiles, they could swim in shallow water, but they certainly weren't swimming across ocean basins. The green area here depicts where Mesosaurus fossils have been located. And so Wegener said, how could this organism evolve on two different continents across ocean basins at the same time. He said the only way that this makes sense is if these continents were at one point connected. He didn't just study Mesosaurus though. Wegener studied somewhere between four and six different fossils, including plants, um, mammals, and reptiles and found them again on opposite sides of ocean basins. And again, came up with the same conclusion. How could these organisms evolve on different continents at the same time. Isn't it more logical to say that they were probably at one point connected? Because in fact, if you do put South America and Africa back into their Pangaea configuration, they form one, con this green zone forms one continuous area. The final bit of evidence that Wegener used was paleoclimate evidence. So paleo means ancient. And in particular, what he looked at was the orientation and the direction of flow of ancient glaciers. So Wegener looked at glaciers in South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. And what he did was he looked at the directions that it looked like glaciers were flowing. And in all of those continents, things didn't really add up. We know that glaciers, like rivers, respond to gravity and flow downhill. But instead, the direction of glacial features, like drumlins, for example, weren't oriented in a direction that made sense. Because it looked like in all of these continents, the glaciers grew from sea level and flowed uphill. And he said, that's not how we know glaciers to behave today. That doesn't make sense with what we are studying in the present. So if we put them back together, though, in Wegener's Pangaea configuration, you see that we have one continuous continental ice sheet where we have the central thickest zone of accumulation. And just like we see in Antarctica and Greenland today, the glaciers are flowing away from that central thick point in all directions, again, consistent with modern observations. So he finished his talk at a scientific conference and people asked questions as they would. And someone raised their hand and said, why? Why are the continents drifting? And this was Wegener's fatal error because he incorrectly suggested that they were responding to forces from the tides. The tides, the rising and falling of tides on Earth originates because of the gravitational pull of the moon. Um, and Wegener said, perhaps over geologic periods of time, uh, it would actually be enough force to cause continents to drift. And it turns out that Wegener was just completely laughed out of the conference at that point. It was demonstrated very quickly that there was not nearly enough force to generate the motion of continents, and people laughed at Wegener. Wegener was largely mocked for the remainder of his career, in fact, and people would often say that if you were trying something without a whole bunch of evidence, that you were pulling a Wegener, that you were making a huge mistake and putting your career on the line, um, and, but Wegener didn't care. 
Wegner kept searching for more evidence for continental drift. He found a lot more. He um, actually ended up dying on an expedition to Greenland, finding more evidence for um, for continental drift. And he, he froze to death during a blizzard. You can actually watch a completely ridiculous but kind of entertaining video about Wegner right in this link here. Um, I will tell you that you will never forget Alfred Wegner after watching the video. But Wegner dies in disgrace. He is not respected by the scientific community when he dies. And it is not until the 1960s that some of the genius in Wegner's ideas were really um, recognized. So the 1950s and the 1960s were a bad time politically in the United States. They're characterized by the Cold War and sometimes heated up. Um, but one of the things that was good was for science, um, there was a lot of money that was put into research. There was a lot of money that was put into seeing if there were ways that you could develop weapons or create accurate maps of the seafloor uh, for things like submarine warfare. So again, not pleasant for the world, but really important for science because we didn't have good maps of the seafloor at that point. There was always also a lot of interest in being able to use like the Earth's magnetic field as a weapon <laughs> um, in submarine warfare and just however else. Um, so there was a, a scientist named Harry Hess. He was a geologist at Princeton University. He is also a former uh, naval officer. And he was on one of these boats that was doing mapping and doing data collection in the 1960s and he created a really important hypothesis that couples with continental drift and that hypothesis is called seafloor spreading which is something that we just know today as divergent plate boundaries in mid-ocean ridge creations but was literally unheard of in the 1960s so what i'm going to do is play a video for you um, that is hosted by Bill Nye the Science Guy um, about one of the 100 most important discoveries in science, um, which is seafloor spreading. World War II. German were on the prowl. To track them, the Allied forces developed new sonar methods, and scientists were enlisted to help survey the ocean floor. When the United States entered the war, Harry Hess was a geology professor at Princeton University. But he also happened to be a Navy reservist, so it wasn't long before he found himself in command of an attack transport ship in the Pacific. To help maneuver when coming in for a beach landing, Hess's ship was equipped with a depth sounder. Now, still being a geologist at heart, he used the sounder to measure the depth of the ocean floor whenever a ship was out to sea. Now, what he discovered startled him. Until the Second World War, most scientists imagined the bottom of the ocean looked like this, flat, lined with nothing but sediment. But about two miles beneath the waves of the Pacific Ocean, Harry Hess discovered something else entirely. Mountains like these here in California, with deep canyons and trenches, hundreds of high peaks that we now believe were once active volcanoes, and all of this at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Surprisingly, though, the discovery of the Pacific Mountain Range is not what makes Harry Hess part of our Great 100. Now, we'll get to that in a minute. To understand where all this is headed, I'd like to skip ahead to another event that set the geology world buzzing. For years, oceanographers surveying the Atlantic Ocean had taken sonar readings that indicated there was something down there, something big. In 1953, they found out what it was, a 12,000-mile-long mountain range. They called it the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The reason it's so great, to fill us in, I paid a visit to Neil Driscoll, a geologist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. One of the big discoveries that was made was that there was this ridge of underwater volcanoes that stood high above the seafloor. How high is a mountain in the middle of the Atlantic? The average seafloor depths are on the order of about four to 5,000 meters. The mid-ocean ridge sits up at about 2,500 meters. So they sit about two and a half kilometers on average higher than the surrounding seafloor that's shown here in the deep blue color. So that's a, 
that's over a mile high. Yes. Right? And that's where Harry Hess comes back into the story. Analyzing core samples and sonar readings from around the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Hess made an astonishing discovery, a phenomenon almost beyond comprehension. The age of the Atlantic Ocean floor, he determined, was progressively older the further it moved away from the ridge. Harry Hess had discovered that the seafloor was spreading. He concluded that molten rock was being forced up from inside the earth at the ridge, where it then formed into new crust on the ocean floor. Gradually, it was pushed away on either side as more molten rock continued pushing up from behind it. Hess called his great discovery seafloor spreading. Harry Hess was in a position that he could bring it all together. Things were spreading apart and new earth was being generated. But if you did this for long enough, the earth should grow. And it doesn't. The earth doesn't get any bigger. No. Harry appreciated the fact that if new earth was being generated in one area, they have to be consumed or recycled in another area. The process that recycles the crust of the spreading ocean floor back inside the earth is called subduction. But as our next great discovery revealed, it's all part of a much larger process, perhaps the most powerful force on the face of the earth. Which is, of course, plate tectonics. So Hess also collected samples of the seafloor, which were then later radioactively dated. When you combine seafloor spreading and, plate tect and continental drift hypotheses, what you come up with is plate tectonics theory. It's the idea that the oceans are moving at mid-ocean ridges and continents are moving. It really creates the idea that we live on a very dynamic planet where both the continents and the oceans are moving regularly. So Hess sort of solidified the seafloor spreading hypothesis by collecting and then age dating some of those samples. So here in black, you see the mid-ocean ridge system. And the colors that you see indicate the age of the ocean crust in millions of years. The warmer the color, the younger the rock, the cooler the color, the older the rock. And what you see in all ocean basins along mid-ocean ridges is that the youngest rocks are right along the mid-ocean ridge and that they get progressively older as you move away, which supports the idea of a divergent plate boundary so that the oceans we know are moving. And based on Wegener's evidence, we know also that the continents are moving. So... Remember that Wegener's fatal flaw was that he couldn't come up with a mechanism, but there was one. The mechanism that is identified from plate, for the driving force behind plate tectonics is convection in the mantle. And this is something that we studied actually in the first chapter, but what you're going to see is that it really comes back here and it kind of it will just help to reaffirm a lot of the things that we've been learning all semester. So remember that the core of the earth is really hot and we know that hot material tends to rise and then it cools off and when it cools off it becomes denser and then it will sink and where we have the upwelling of material in the mantle we have spreading of the crust and that will create divergent plate boundaries whether you're on land or in the ocean and you're mostly in the ocean and where you have sinking of crust after material gets cooled off and becomes denser and starts to sink, that's where we have convergent boundaries.